by your holy name. Shabbat gathering. We praise Elohim for his goodness to us. And we trust that each one of you have had a blessed week this week. We want to say Shabbat Shalom to each of you. Amen. We want to say Shabbat Shalom to each of you that are joining us by live stream. We're grateful for the mercies of our Elohim upon each and every one of us. Yes. He has kept us alive and well. He has answered our prayers. He has made sure that we have provisions. Yes. There's not enough that we could say about the goodness of our Elohim. Oh, yes. He is good. The scriptures tell us his mercies endure forever and his truth to every generation. Right. Blessed be the mighty one of Israel. And so we want to encourage each one of you to express your appreciation unto the Almighty. And as we prepare ourselves to offer prayer, I do want to uh, remind us that Shabbat is a sacred day, that our Shabbat gathering is a sacred time. The Almighty has called it a holy mikra. He has called it a sacred time of assembling. So our gathering on the Shabbat, it's not just a time of coming together to have a worship service, but it, this is something we do out of our obedience to the Creator because he has declared this to be a holy convocation, a sacred time of gathering. And so we want to be mindful of that. Each of you that are joining with us by live stream, you are also included in this holy or Kadosh Mikra that we are a part of. And we want to set our minds apart. We want to set uh, the name of Elohim apart in our hearts. Yes. And we want to put aside all of the cares, concerns, and worries of our past week. And even of this day, many times we carry things with us into the Shabbat. But this is a time where Elohim alone deserves our attention. And so with that being said, let us all stand to our feet 
let us offer prayer to the Most High at this time. Avinu Melkenu, our Father, our King, we bless your great name. And we thank you today for your mercies upon each and every one of us. We thank you, Abba, that you have always kept your covenant with Zion. We thank you that you have been our father, that you have provided for our needs. We thank you, Abba, that you have answered our prayers and that you know what things we have need of before we even ask you. For that, Abba, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for being with us throughout this week and bringing us to this Shabbat Yom, this Shabbat day. And Abba, we want to say thank you for every need met. Abba, we do pray for those who are experiencing loss, their brethren of the congregation that have gone to be with family in other parts of the world yes. as a result of family transitioning to be with you. Yes. We ask comfort their hearts, yes. Yes. comfort the family, yes. give them strength, give them comfort during this time. Yes. Abba Yah, we ask also that you would touch the unbelievers in the world those in our community, in the region, and around the world. Our prayer is that they may come to the knowledge of the truth, that they may know the Messiah, Yahshua, whom you sent. We pray, Father, for the sick and the shut-in. Send healing to those that are struggling with illness in Zion, in Israel. Send healing to your people according to the word of the covenant. The word of the covenant, it informs us that you remove sickness from us. It informs us that healing is a benefit that we should never forget. Hallelujah. Father, we praise you. We thank you for all of these wonderful benefits that you have made available for us so that we could have a quality life in the world you made. Now, Abba, <clears throat> order the course of this gathering today. I pray your anointing be in every aspect of it. I pray your Mashiach be in the teaching. May your voice be heard. May Zion be strengthened, built up, and edified. Yes, yes. May your people come into a greater understanding of who you are and what your purposes are for their lives. Yes. And then after everything is said and done, Father, we will give you the praise and the glory. Mm -hmm. Through the mighty name of our Messiah, Yahshua, we do bless and we do thank you. Let everyone say amen. amen. Yes, yes, yes. Bless the Holy One of Israel today. Yeah. Hallelujah. Let us remain standing. We want to hear the reading of the Shema. Bless His Holiness. Hallelujah. We're going to be reading <clears throat> in Devarim chapter 6, the fourth verse. I will declare the Shema in Hebrew, and then I will read verses 4 through 9. The book of Devarim, book of the words, commonly called Deuteronomy. Chapter 6, fourth verse. Shema Yisrael, Yahuwah Eloheinu, Yahuwah Echad. Hear, O Israel. Yahuwah, 
Our Elohim, Yahuwah, is one. And you shall love Yahuwah, your Elohim, with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. And you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them upon the posts of your house and on your gates. Bless his name. Yes. Now let us turn to the fifth chapter of Devarim. We're going to read beginning at the sixth verse through verse 21. When you have it, say amen. Mm -hmm. Devarim, chapter 5, beginning at verse 6. I am Yahuwah Eloheka, that means our Elohim, which brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim from the house of bondage. You shall have no other Elohim before me, you shall not make any graven images or any likeness of anything that is in the heavens above or on the earth beneath or that is in the waters beneath the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, Yahuwah, Elohecha, am a jealous El, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generations of them that hate me, and showing mercy or kindness to thousands of them that love me and keep or guard my commandments. You shall not take the name of Yahuwah Elohecha in vain, for Yahuwah will not hold him guiltless that takes his name in vain. Guard the day of the Shabbat to sanctify it as Yahuwah Elohecha has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all of your work, but the seventh day is the Shabbat of Yahuwah Elohecha. In it you shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, nor your manservant, nor your maidservant nor your ox, nor your ass, nor any of your cattle, nor the stranger that is within your gates or settlements, that your manservant and your maidservant may rest as well as you. And remember that you were a servant or a slave in the land of Mitzrayim, that's Egypt, and that Yahuwah Elohecha brought you out thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore, Yahuwah Elohecha, your Elohim, commanded you to keep this, the day of Shabbat. <clears throat> Honor or to provide for your father and your mother, as Yahuwah Elohecha has commanded you that your days may be prolonged and that it may go well with you. In the land which Yahuwah Elohecha gives you, you shall not kill, you shall not break wedlock or commit adultery, neither shall you steal, neither shall you bear false witness against your neighbor, neither shall you lust or desire after or covet your neighbor's Wife, neither shall you covet after your neighbor's house, his field, or his manservant, or his maidservant, his ox, or his ass, or anything that is your neighbor's. Bless the mighty one of Israel. Now we shall read from the writings of the apostles. We're going to read from the Besorah narrative of Mark, chapter 12, 
verse 28. Mark chapter 12, verse 28 through 31. You have it, say amen. And one of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And Yahshua answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, Yahuwah, our Elohim, Yahuwah, is one. And you shall love Yahuwah, your Elohim, with all of your heart, and with all of your soul, and with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is none other commandment greater than these. Baruch Hashem, the Most High be praised. You may have your seats. We praise Elohim today for this Shabbat. We thank him for the word that he has given to his people. And I need to say that the word that Elohim has given to his people is not exclusive to Zion alone, but it is for the whole human family. The scriptures we read on each Shabbat, they have been intended for the whole human family. Torah was given unto Adam initially before it was codified or written down and men knew the ways of Elohim. And so when we read the commands when we remind ourselves of who our Elohim is yes, yes. and that he is Echad, he is one, we reaffirm certain things about his nature among ourselves. But this word is for the whole human race to be reminded of so that the unbelieving may know that Elohim has a standard in the earth for those whom he has made. And he also wants everyone to know that he has great mercies upon those who are in unbelief. And in his mercies, he has sent a redeemer by the name of Yahshua, who has come to restore the way back to the Father. Yahshua made the declaration and he said that I am the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man can come to the Father but by me. Him coming and making that declaration was so that we might have restored fellowship with our Elohim. And I want to encourage Zion to continue to love Elohim, continue to be obedient to him. And those who may be watching that may not be believers, we want you to know that the Father loves you and he is calling you back to himself. He says to you, believe on his Messiah, Yahshua, repent and be saved. Hallelujah. Well, at this time, we want to prepare ourselves for our time of praise and singing unto the Almighty. And as my wife is getting ready to come, uh, we want you to just be comfortable and to give glory unto the Most High. Hallelujah. If anyone is worthy of praise, your creator is. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So let's give him the praises. 
and the glory. Hallelujah. Bless his great name. Hallelujah. Bless him. Bless him. Hallelujah. We bless the Almighty. Bless his great name. You have the books there if you want one. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord, for this another opportunity to be here in your presence today, a time that we come for worship and to praise you and to give you the honor and Hallelujah. the glory. Hallelujah. We thank you on today. If it was not for him, I don't know what, where we would be. If it wasn't for the Lord on our side, yes. said, Hallelujah. Israel shall say, where would we be? Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. Let the redeemed of the Lord, the Alba, Yah, say so. Hallelujah. Bless your great name. We're going to sing. Let praises rise from the inside. Give me just a moment here. Hallelujah. Thank you, Savior. Give me just a moment here. Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm still on my page. Bless your name. Hallelujah. We've, uh, we're just blessed that the Lord has seen us through another week, another opportunity, another chance to come together and to, and to give him the glory hallelujah we can't praise him enough i don't care what type of how proud you are or how much uh you feel you do for yourself but there is there is nothing like him there's nobody like the lord hallelujah there's nobody like him bless his name hallelujah are we on yeah i think it's set i'm not sure exactly it's having trouble are we on Oh, I know why. Hand me my phone. I have to take it off of that one. Bless his great, excellent name. Amen. 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 We, you know, what did we do before we had all of these devices and all of that? We sang, we sang the old, we sang the old song like, what a mighty y'all we serve. That's what we used to sing. What a mighty Yah we serve. Angels bow before him. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty Yah we serve. What a mighty Yah we serve. What a mighty Yah we serve. Angels bow. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before him. Heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. He is the King of Kings. He is the King. Our King. He is our Lord. Our Lord. He is the King of Kings. 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 He is the King of Hallelujah, that praise is rise. I believe that one is in the song book for you. Hallelujah. Let praises rise from the inside. Let we delight in you from the inside. From the inside. From the inside.
Thank you, Nate. Something about that name. Every king and kingdom is going to pass away. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When this name is proclaimed in the earth, hallelujah. When he comes back, hallelujah. He is going to be reigning king and visible kingdom. Hallelujah. Bless his name. Hallelujah. We know him as a way maker. Amen. Let's sing this one. Hallelujah. Bless his great name. Hallelujah. Yes, it is. Hallelujah. Oh, we just, I just feel the worship in this house. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's been raining here. But that sweet aroma. Hallelujah. That refreshing glory. Hallelujah. We worship you. I worship you. Oh, we worship you, Lord. I worship you. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. Hallelujah! Working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. Come on, he's the way to You are here. Hallelujah! He's the work it out. Moving in oh. on me. I worship you. I can't help but to praise him. I worship you. I can't help but to praise you. You are here.
Do your hands go to see him on? Yes, bless his excellent name. Hallelujah, we thank you, Lord. Ooh, I just felt his presence in this, in this place on today. Hallelujah. When the reality hits you that he is great no matter what you're going through, he is still on the yard. Amen. Praise his praise. Great name. Praise Yahuwah. Proclaiming that he reigns. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Yes, you reign. Hallelujah. Bless your name. Oh, God. Bless the mighty one of Israel. Oh, thank you. Bless thank you, thank you. Yes, the Lord. mighty one thank of Israel. You, thank you, Lord. He is great. Yes, he is. And greatly to be praised. To be Hallelujah. Praised. Hallelujah. Your great name is worthy to be Hallelujah. praised. Hallelujah. All praises to the living Elohim. All praises to the living Elohim. Hallelujah. Yahuwah be praised. He is worthy to be praised, Zion. Hallelujah. He is worthy to be praised. Blessed be his holiness. We thank the Almighty today for his goodness and his mercies upon each and every one of us. Hallelujah. It is always appropriate to give glory and praise and honor to our maker. Bless his name. Yes. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Wonderful thing that we've discovered about our Elohim is that he not only made us, but he sustains us. We can't live without his sustaining power. He keeps us with breath. He gives us the ability to function in our bodies. Hallelujah. He gives us the mental ability to be able to think, be able to process information. Without him, we would not be able to survive. We would not be able to function as living beings. Even the unbeliever, the atheist, the one who has rejected the very idea of there being a creator, a mighty one greater than themselves. Their soul dependence is upon the most high for their very existence. We know that in him we live and we move and we have our being. That's literal. That's literal. That's not something that is spiritual. That's literal. It's by his mercies that every human being has the ability to function in this world. And should the Almighty decide to remove the breath, we would not exist. So the Almighty decide to somehow allow our mental capacity to go down, we would not be able to function. No, we wouldn't. But it is because of his mercies that we are here. It is because of his mercies that we have what we have. And for that, we're grateful. Hallelujah. This time I want to uh, share our announcements with us uh, briefly. As you know, we are in our Shabbat gathering, which meets every Shabbat at 1230 p.m. And also on Shabbat, we have our School of Messiah Bible Institute classes at 4 p.m. However, on today, we are canceling our class on today. We will uh, resume on next Shabbat. So please uh, tune in at 4 p.m. on Shabbat for School of Messiah. Right now, we do not have a course scheduled. We will in another three weeks. So we will be providing uh, 
individual teachings to bring the word to you. We also want you to be mindful of our midweek schedule on each Wednesday evening at 6.30 p.m. We have our time of prayer where we come together corporately and we pray. And I want to encourage those who may be living outside of the region to call our prayer line. We do have a prayer line where you can share with us your prayer, your prayer requests, your prayer needs. And also you can join with us in prayer as well. Uh, that prayer line number is 605-313-5500. Again, that uh, prayer line that we have is 605-313-5500. Also, there's an access code that's associated with that prayer line. That access code is 110385. Again, that access code is 110385. Uh, please uh, call that prayer line. Share with us your prayer needs. We'd love to receive them and to intercede for you with regard to your prayer needs. And don't just leave your prayer needs with us. Please stay, join us in prayer. We believe that it is important for us to pray together. There's a scripture that teaches us how the unity and the togetherness of those who come together brings about strength and effectiveness. And uh, the passage, <clears throat> It says that a threefold cord cannot be easily broken. It's like a braid. Hallelujah. When we're able to come together and pray together, there's greater strength. And I believe that wholeheartedly. So we want to encourage you to pray with us when you call in. Also, after we finish our time of prayer at 730 on uh Wednesday as well, we have biblical teaching, and we have just started in the book, or shall I say, letter to the Colossians. We're in Colossians in chapter one, and so as we began this book, I believe it's important that uh, those of you who have not yet been viewing our midweek teaching times, please join us on uh, Wednesday evening at 7.30 p.m. We live stream all of our teaching times. And if you're not able to get us on the live stream, then by all means, view us on YouTube. Our YouTube channel is Voice of Messiah Ministries, and you can view the playback and share that playback with others. We believe that the teachings that we provide are very effective and they bring forth the word of Elohim to help enrich and to give counsel and guidance and most of all deliverance to those who are in need of deliverance. Hallelujah. Scripture tells us that the word is quick and powerful or it is alive and powerful. And it is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of the soul and the spirit and of the joints and the marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The word is powerful. It can do all of that. All of that. It can go anywhere, everywhere. It knows how to do the job. We believe that as we declare this word, as we teach the word and put it out into the media that Elohim uses it to touch lives, to break yokes, to set people free, and to disciple men and women into the ways of Elohim. And that is our intention as we bring the word. So by all means, please uh, tune in when we're teaching. And if not, catch us on the playback. Voice of Messiah Ministries, 
on our YouTube channel. Uh, also want to remind us of the Moed on next week uh, after Shabbat on next week on June the 5th in the afternoon at 1230 we will be celebrating Shavuot the Feast of Weeks commonly called Pentecost by many so uh, let's be mindful of that celebration as well hallelujah all right Blessed be the mighty one of Israel. That's a Sunday. Hallelujah. That's a Sunday. <clears throat> At this time, we want to prepare for our history bit. And something that we want to share in this history bit that we believe will be essential to each one of you in all of our history bits the goal is to help to inform Zion Zion of information that we believe is important and significant for us in understanding the scripture more accurately to help give us a broader perspective, more of an in-depth understanding of what Elohim has done by looking into the things that have been written. There's much that has been written that many of us are unaware of that uh, has great impact with respect to our understanding of the things of Elohim. And I have found that the information that we will share today will definitely help with our understanding of the fact that Elohim was bringing about a prophetic, and I like to say, a prophetic change and uh, what I like to do is share a reading from the book of Josephus noted historian of the first century and he's a Judean Israelite he's the one who is responsible for writing the history of the Judean Israelites. And this particular book that we're going to read from, it's from War of the Jews. And we're going to look at book number six, chapter five, and paragraph three. For those who would like to search that information for themselves. This reading is going to concern itself with the gates of the temple opening by themselves. I'll say it again. It's going to concern itself with the gates of the temple opening by themselves. I do want to share the significance of that and how this particular event brought fulfillment to the prophecy of scripture that relates to the oncoming destruction of the temple. So let's go and read in War of the Jews. Listen to what Josephus tells us. Thus were the miserable people persuaded by these deceivers and such as belied God himself. While they did not attend nor give credit to the signs that were so evident, 
and did so plainly foretell their future desolation. But like men infatuated without either eyes to see or minds to consider, did not regard the denunciations that God made to them. Thus, there was a star resembling a sword which stood over the city and a comet that continued a whole year. Thus also, before the Jews or the Judeans' rebellion and before those commotions which preceded the war, when the people were come in great crowds to the Feast of Unleavened Bread on the eighth day of the month, Xanticus, that's Nisan, which is uh, the first month of the biblical calendar. And at the ninth hour of the night, so great light shone round the altar and the holy house that it appeared to be bright daytime. This would be three o'clock in the morning which light lasted for half an hour. This light seemed to be a good sign to the unskillful, but was so interpreted by the sacred scribes as to portend those events that followed immediately upon it. At the same festival also, a heifer, as she was led by the high priest to be sacrificed, brought forth a lamb in the midst or the middle of the temple. Moreover, the eastern gate, I want you to hear this part because this is the central focus of our history bit. Moreover, the eastern gate of the inner court of the temple, which was of brass, and vastly heavy, and had been with difficulty shut by 20 men and rested upon a basis armed with iron and had bolts fastened very deep into the firm floor, which was there made of one entire stone, was seen to be opened of its own accord about the sixth hour of the night. This would be 12 midnight according to the Western time. Now these or those that kept watch in the temple came hereupon running to the captain of the temple and told him of it who then came up there and not without great difficulty was able to shut the gate again. This also appeared to be to the vulgar, or this also appeared to the vulgar, this the common folk, to be a very happy prodigy, as if God did thereby open them the gate of happiness. But the men of learning understood it, that the security of their holy house was dissolved of its own accord, and that the gate was opened for the advantage of their enemies. So these publicly declared that the signal foreshadowed the desolation that was coming upon them. Now, in this writing, Josephus was providing a history of what happened at the temple during the time of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, this was during a time when the Romans were on their way to make war with the Judean Israelites that had rebelled against them. 
This was roughly around that time frame of 70 CE. And the people who were not familiar with scripture upon seeing these signs thought that it was a good sign that possibly Elohim was going to give them victory. But as Josephus notes, the men of learning who read scripture and understood prophecy knew that this was a fulfillment of what was about to take place, which would be the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, when you go into the book of Zechariah, the prophet, the uh, 11th chapter, I believe it is, in the first few verses. Matter of fact, let me go to it. <clears throat> let me go to it. It provides a statement in the text which, bless his name, <clears throat> It provides a statement in the text that gives us prophetic insight regarding the destruction of the temple. In Zechariah chapter 11, I'm going to read the first verse. It says, open your doors, O Lebanon, that the fire may devour your seeds. I'll read it again. It says, open your doors, O Lebanon, that the fire may devour your cedars. Now, Lebanon was a cold word for the temple because the temple was made primarily from the cedars of Lebanon. So when the ancient sages and teachers read this prophecy, they knew that this meant that should the doors or the entrance ways of the temple would open on their own accord, it would mark the coming destruction of the temple. Because the first few words in this first verse says what? Open your doors. Right? Oh, Lebanon. The text is presented in a symbolic fashion. And it's telling us that when the entrance ways of the temple would open by themselves, then that would mark the oncoming destruction of the temple. And this is why Josephus, when he made mention that the men of learning, when they saw it, when they saw the gates opening by themselves, they knew that it wouldn't be long. They knew that the Romans coming in would not be a time of Israel's victory, but a time of Israel's defeat. Mm -hmm. wow. As Josephus notes about the gate, he took great detail in describing how strong and heavy and massive this gate was and how secure it was and how it was firmly fixed that it took 20 men to open the gate. 20 men, and that this gate opened by itself. So as we begin to discover some of the things that are noted in history, we see that when we look in the Bible, after the death of our Messiah, we read, that the veil of the temple, mm -hmm. it opened by itself. Amen. Say that. 
we're told that it was rent or torn beginning from the top all the way down to the bottom. And just to add um, to this, you know, there were three entranceways leading up to the very presence of what we would regard as the presence of Elohim, the Ark of the Covenant. There's the gates, which we just read about historically. There's the doors, which brings you in to the actual temple. And then there is the parochette, the veil of the temple. And although I did not mention anything about the doors of the temple opening, but there is historical note of the doors of the temple also opening by themselves. And so these things that we read historically, they show us the activity of our Elohim in bringing to pass his word. Sometimes when we read in the scriptures and we only look at the witness of the scripture text, we think that that's the only way in which the Most High is able to provide a witness to secure the truthfulness or veracity of the prophetic word. But the Almighty secures the veracity of his prophetic word, not just by what's written in the biblical text, but also by the history that's written by all lookers of things that happened right before them that, that, that are related to a particular prophecy. And in this case, the one that has to do with the opening of the entranceways of the temple. And so Zion, it's important that we begin to keep our hearts open, keep our minds open, because there is a great deal of information that we have yet to discover that will bring confirmation to prophecy, that will bring confirmation to the message that we preach, that will bring confirmation about the walk that we perform before our Elohim. And with that being said, the Most High be praised. Hallelujah. Well, Zion, at this time, we want to prepare ourselves for the teaching. And I'd like to ask for you to open your Bibles to the book of Revelation. Book of Revelation, we're going to go to the 20th chapter. Picking up from where we left off. Revelation chapter 20. We're going to read verses 4 through 6. Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 through 6. When you have it, say amen. Yes. amen. Bless the Almighty. Beginning at the fourth verse, Revelation chapter 20. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them. And judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Yeshua and for the word of Elohim and which had not worshipped the beast 
neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Mashiach a thousand years. Verse 5. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. I'll repeat. This is the first resurrection. Verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. On such, the second death has no power. But they shall be priests. Kohani of Elohim and of Mashiach and shall reign with him a thousand years. Let us pray. Abba Yah, thank you for this time to be able to provide the teaching of scripture in this text. I ask that you would give me wisdom and insight in the teaching. I ask that your Mashiach anointing be upon your servant to share the word with clarity and with power. I pray, Abba, that your voice would be heard in the teaching, that the minds, hearts, ears of each one assembled would be open and receptive to your truth. I pray, Father, that you bring encouragement and edification to each one assembled. Bring enlightenment that will cause each attender to have a greater hunger for your truth and to walk according to your ways. Yes, 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 yes. Now, Father, I do bless you. I trust in your Ruach to guide and to direct me in the teaching. And in everything done, may you be praised and exalted through the mighty name of Yahshua, our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Bless the mighty one of Israel. Mm -hmm. Today we're looking at Revelation chapter 20, yes. verses 4 through 6. We're looking at only three verses in this teaching today. Mm -hmm. We want to share concerning the first resurrection and the messianic kingdom. Yes. Goodness. We are not able to be <clears throat> exhaustive in dealing with the subject, but we do want to hit some of the pertinent points that concern ourselves with this section of scripture. Amen. It's been rich. We observed in the last teaching, the first three verses of chapter 20, of what happened to the dragon and how mighty Malak or angel had a chain and bound the dragon and put him in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. And we were told who the dragon is, that it was or is Satan, 
the Satan, Hasatan, mm -hmm. and the devil. We were told that he is the accuser and he is also the one who opposes us, mm -hmm. our enemy. We were told that he would be removed from his present domain. He is called the prince of the power of the air, which means that he roams throughout the spiritual atmosphere, which is also among us here that live on the earth. And so his domain is among the sons of men in the realm of the spirit, influencing the hearts and minds of those who are open to his voice. In the future, a time is coming where he will be removed from the scene and he will be imprisoned he will be incarcerated yes. for a long period of time. The scripture says a thousand years. Yes. And after we were informed about his future imprisonment, we are then told of what is to take place which will usher us into the Messianic kingdom. Mm -hmm. So Yochanan moves from one vision, one scene to another scene. Yes. He finishes with seeing the future of Hasatan's incarceration to now seeing something more appealing to him. Something that makes him excited about his future destiny. I'm sure that when he began to take hold of his vision that his mind probably went back to some of the things that the Messiah had told him when the Messiah walked with him. Because, see, the Messiah had told the twelve that they would sit with him in his kingdom. Yes, yes, yes. The Messiah had told him that they would rule over the twelve tribes of Israel in his kingdom. So now John is beholding another vision. And as he begins to describe the vision, he tells us, look at what he says. Fourth verse, he says, and I saw thrones. <laughs> he went from seeing the devil put in prison to now seeing thrones. You can't tell me when you see thrones that it's not a glorious sight. You, you just stepped into a whole different environment. You just stepped into a royal environment when you see thrones. Think of stepping into the palace of a king. Think of stepping into the palace of the emperor. Think of stepping into the Oval Office of the President. And those of you who know anything about government, you got to go through a whole lot of hoops and this and that and the other to be able to be in that kind of an environment. They don't just let you in. Matter of fact, before you even come in, you've got to make sure that you're dressed right. you you got to be prepped on, on what to say and what not to say before you even come into those environments. Mm -hmm. 
But here we have the Apostle John saying, and I saw thrones. Now mind you, our Messiah had just whooped and destroyed all of the kings of the earth. Every king, every president, every emperor, every prime minister, whatever title you want to put on someone who is a head over a country or government or nation, our Messiah dethroned them all and executed all of them that were in defiance of his authority and sovereign rule. Now listen, listen, listen. John had just prophesied and told us about what was going to happen over in chapter 19 of Revelation. But now, he says, I see thrones. Who? <laughs> yes. He said, now this vision is good here. I like this one. I didn't got enough for the dragon. I done got enough of seeing what he done did and, mm -hmm. and how he's messed up the lives of people. I, I done got enough of seeing all of his activity and his mess and his defiance of, of the sovereign one of the universe. He said, look, look, he, he's done with now. He's been locked up. He said, I see thrones. But wait a minute, I don't just see thrones, he says. I also see those who are sitting upon the thrones. I'm sure Yochanan probably saw himself, <laughs> saw Peter, saw Yaakov. I'm sure he saw Titus. I'm sure he saw all of the 12 except Yehuda, who's the son of perdition, commonly called Judas of Iscariot. Messiah said that you've kept all of the ones. Mm -hmm. Or he said, I kept all of those whom you've given me, except, yes, yes. except Judas, the son of perdition. So he's going to see those sitting upon the thrones. Mm -hmm. He doesn't give a number. He doesn't give names. He just says, I see those sitting upon thrones. And it appears to me that it might have been more than just 12 thrones there. I don't know how many thrones were there. I'm just saying. But he talks about what he sees. And that judgment was given to them. So what happens is now there are thrones and those who were sitting on the thrones were given the power, the authority of judgment. Paul made a statement and he said, don't you know you are going to judge angels? This is what he said to the saints. This was some revelation that Paul had. Now, Paul is not among the 12 apostles. And y'all quit saying that he should have been. No, he was not supposed to be among the 12 apostles. If he was, then he would have been. Paul was in the place he was supposed to be in. Quit trying to elevate him higher than what he is. He's great. We're not going to take nothing from him. But the most high is the one that's orchestrated all of this. See, judgment is given to all of the saints. All of the saints. And he says judgment was given to them. That means now they had authority to exercise governmental rule. Did y'all hear me? They had authority to exercise governmental rule. Did you hear that? So what we see is a shift now 
with a different government being put in place in the earth. With the overthrow of the kings of the earth and the declaration that Yahshua is called the king of kings and the Lord of lords and he had many crowns upon his head. We talked about that in the 19th chapter of Revelation, remember? He had what? Many didn't just have one crown. He had many crowns upon his head because he took the crowns of the other kings. You recall when we read how that his vesture was dipped in blood and he went forth to slaughter yes. all of his enemies. We talked about that, Yeshua. Mm -hmm. Now we have a new government in place. And not only is Messiah ruling, but all of those who are attached to Messiah are ruling with him. We read in the text and we see that it says that those, that's plural, right? Sitting up on the thrones were given governmental authority. So we see the kingdom of Messiah being set up. In the kingdom of Messiah, Messiah rules and Israel rules with him. But notice now in the second part of the fourth verse, notice something. That after he describes those who were sitting upon the thrones and had judgment committed into their hands, he begins to describe, and this is what I believe, another group of people. Because, because what he says is, and, you, you hear that? And I saw the souls of them. Wait a minute. Who are these souls? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he describes these souls. Yes, he does. He says, And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Yeshua and for the word of Elohim and which had not worshipped the beast nor his image, nor had received his mark upon their head or their hand. Now, why is it important that this group be described separately from those who are sitting upon thrones? When I would read this, I would just lump it all together and I would conclude that when he's talking about the souls, he's referring to all believers from all ages. At this stage in my understanding of the scripture text, I've come to understand it differently. Because as we already discussed, there was a group of believers who were alive during the time of the reign of the beast, that last three and a half year period. And we were told about them specifically that they were the ones who did not worship the beast or his image. Neither did they receive his mark upon their forehead or on their hand. We were told about them specifically. Now, the beast has not yet been revealed. We know that the beast's kingdom is alive and it is moving forward, but the beast has not yet been revealed. 
and there is no image of the beast that has been made where men and women have been called to bow down and to worship. I know there's some people out there that want to spiritualize certain things and say, well, the image of the beast is this, and the mark of the beast is this. You got people who will say, well, you know, if you take the vaccine, the COVID vaccine, that that's the mark of the beast. No, it's not the mark of the beast. Mm -hmm. Whatever perspectives people may have on wanting to or not wanting to take the vaccine, that's a debate that people can have among themselves. But that's not the mark of the beast. Because the mark of the beast is something that will be enforced and those who do not receive it to claim allegiance to the beast's kingdom will be executed. We are not in that day. Not yet. These souls we are told about specifically, notice what it says, he said, I saw the souls of them that what? Were beheaded? Yes. Now, every believer is not going to be beheaded for the witness of Messiah. Y'all know that, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody's not going to be beheaded for the witness of Messiah. We may be persecuted for it, but not all of us are going to be beheaded for it. But specifically, it says... I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness and for the word. And these same folk did not worship who? The beast. So there's a specific group of people that lived during that three and a half year period when the beast had dominion in the earth realm. Had an image made, the false prophet promoted the beast. And they said, if you're going to be able to buy or sell, you're going to have to take this mark. We haven't gotten to that time yet. I can still go into the store and buy and sell. I don't have a mark on my hand. I don't have nothing on my forehead. And for those of y'all who are tripping about the vaccine, I haven't taken the vaccine. But for those who have, I don't condemn them either. Just, just so that we, we, we straight, because many folk are tripping on that right now. Y'all need, need to stay, stay with the Bible. Anytime you hear teaching that does not follow the exactitude of what this text says, mm -hmm. do not receive it. I don't care how close they may say, or what this, oh, well, it is, no. Stick with the exactitude of the text. We have people who have come up in just about every generation and have said, that's the mark of the beats. That's the beats. They want to try and figure out the name of the beast through somebody's name, or they figure this person is so wicked they have to be, have to be the beast. No. We already have the scripture written in the book of Revelation. We already know what things will take place. Yes. Messiah has not split the clouds yet and taken away Zion yet because before, before the beast has full control, Zion's got to be removed. Y'all ain't, ain't hearing this. Mm -hmm. And it's not going to be some secret rapture either. Everyone's going to see Messiah in the clouds. Everyone is going to hear the trumpet blow. Everybody, believer and unbeliever, everybody's going to hear the trumpet blow. And they're going to see the righteous be translated up into the clouds and taken. And when they see all of this taking place, y'all listening to me, I'm trying to help us to understand that we have not come to that time yet. Yes, yes. All of these things have to take place first. Mm -hmm. 
Being some major things, y'all. We, this, we see, are we, are we getting this? Are we getting this? There ain't no secret rapture. So quit believing that, that mess. The book says the trumpet's going to sound. Every eye will see him. Did y'all hear that? Every eye is going to see him. And after the saints are translated in the clouds, because it says that there will be four angels that will be stationed holding back the four winds, holding back the four winds. See, everything's just going to stop for a moment. It's just going to stop. The saints are going to be translated. Those unbelievers in the world are going to see what's going to be going on, and people are going to start tripping. They're going to go nuts because all of their mockery, all of their <laughs> unbelief, yes. they're going to become fearful. And as the text tells us, it says that they're going to go high in caves and under rocks. Say, fall on us. Because the wrath of the Lamb has come. It's come. Yes. They heard the preaching. They heard us. They heard the prophets, the apostles, the evangelists, pastors, and teachers. They heard us. Mm -hmm. They talked about us. <laughs> they heard us. But when they see the saints get up and go right before their eyes, and they're still here, they're going to become afraid. Mm -hmm. Now understand something. After that takes place, then all of the events that are related to the image of the beast, the mark of the beast, and all of that is going to happen. Mm -hmm. So Zion, mm -hmm. quit trying, quit trying to lay up on people that this is the mark of the beast and that's the mark of the beast. It ain't happened yet. But we do know that many things are precursors to what's coming. But those who will not be in that translation will be that group of people that will have to deal with the conditions and the consequences that will come for holding faithful to Messiah for holding faithful to the word of Elohim for not bowing the knee to the image of the beast for, 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 for saying no to the mark of the beast and, and said look we'll starve before we take your mark we, we'll, we'll starve before we put our forehead out for you to put some mark on it our hand out for you to put some mark on it we'll go hide somewhere and figure out how we'll live and do life before we submit to you because we already know what the outcome will be. Yes. And many of these, if they are caught, they'll be beheaded. So, so John describes this particular select group of people yes, yes. who live during the last few years of the rule of the beast kingdom. He says, I saw them. I saw them. They didn't make it with those who were translated. They actually went up at a different time. They went up right before the Messiah came to make war with his enemies. Yes. We read that in the scripture text. Yes. Well, the Bible says, the angel called out and said, throw down your sickle and reap the harvest of the earth. After that harvest was reaped, we read about it in Revelation. After that harvest was reaped, what happened? Then another angel was summoned to go down and to gather the great vine in the earth and put it in the wine press of the wrath of Elohim. That's what we read in the text of scripture, yes. previous chapters. Hallelujah. Mm. 
He says, I saw these people. They were there too. And his conclusion was that they lived and reigned with the Messiah a thousand years. So, so in other words, those who were dead live again. That's right. Those who were dead live again. <laughs> Verse 5 tells us the rest of the dead didn't live until after the thousand years were over. But those who I saw, they lived again. And Yochanan said, this is the first resurrection. He said, this represents the first resurrection. He said, they made it. The first resurrection. Verse 5, we're told some things. Hmm. At this first resurrection is the group of people that will be a part of this new government. How do we know that all of them will be a part of the government? You know, Yochanan says that he saw some he said, sitting on thrones, and then he says, I saw the souls of those who were beheaded. Well, the text says that they all lived and reigned mm -hmm. with Messiah a thousand years. So everybody reigned with the Messiah for a thousand years. Bless the Holy One of Israel. We see that the first resurrection proceeds the Messianic Kingdom Age. When we look at verse 6, we are told that those who are a part of the first resurrection are the blessed. Yes. They are the blessed Thank you. and holy. holy. Oh, you mean to tell me that the people are holy people? Yes. It says blessed and holy. Y'all hear that? Uh -huh. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. People don't like to talk about holiness much. Matter of fact, much of the preaching that I hear that comes across many pulpits likes to evade the term holiness or likes to evade the idea of people being holy. I hear much preached across pulpits that commonly want to convey the present condition of people. That we are sinners saved by grace. Because we constantly want to appeal to the mercy of Elohim. We want to constantly appeal to the kindness of Elohim. We want to appeal to the long suffering of Elohim. And bless the most high he is, all of that. And, and I don't in any way demean any of those qualities that's in Elohim. I wouldn't be standing here today if he was not merciful and kind and long suffering. Most I know I've had some struggles and have fallen and have, and, and have done some things that have been displeasing. Mm -hmm. But but as, as an astute student of the scriptures, I've also come to terms with the reality that I have the responsibility to follow peace with all men and holiness mm -hmm. or the holiness as the scripture more properly is translated. The writer of Hebrews makes a statement and he says, follow thou peace with all men and the holiness, which represents the holiness code. Or let me just break it down real simple. The keeping of the Torah commands. 
which is what the Western church don't want to tell you. Holiness is keeping the commands of the Most High Yahuwah because it is the commands of the Most High Yahuwah that sets you apart or makes you holy. Hello, somebody. Many prayers that are prayed, one of the statements that's made in our Hebrew culture is that you have sanctified us by your commandments. I hear the Messiah making a statement over in Yochanan or John chapter 17. When he was praying for his disciples and he was asking the father to keep them, he said to the father, sanctify them with your truth. Yes. And then he said, your word is truth. Come on here. Uh, people don't like to talk about holiness. But if you're going to be in the first resurrection, you're going to have to be holy. Ah! Hallelujah. I'll never back down from preaching about holiness. I'll never back down from preaching about obedience. I'll never back down from preaching about dying to your flesh, submitting to the authority of the Creator. I might not every day live in obedience every single day, but I got the good enough sense to know that I'm going to strive for it. Bless his holy name. I got the good enough sense to know that we are required to pursue this life of obedience to the commandments. I don't make any excuses for sin like some others do. Some, you know, will say, well, you know, the Lord knows we weak. Yeah, he knows you weak. That's why he gave you the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. We don't like to read what the prophet Yetzikiel said. <laughs> when the Most High said about the time that's coming, he said, I'm going to put my spirit in you. Yes. And this is what Elohim said. He said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to put my spirit in you. Yes. And then he tells us why. He says, so that you might keep my commandments and my statutes and my judgments. He said, I know you had some trouble in the past. That's why you, you, you've been taken into captivity. That's why you've been divorced from me. You've been removed from the land. But I'm going to fix up all of that. I'm going to renew the covenant. I'm going to bring you back to myself. I'm going to send my servant to go and to hunt for you, to fish for you. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Y'all know the Bible talks about him hunting and fishing, <laughs> right? The prophet said that. And he also described him as one being a shepherd going throughout the mountains and valleys searching for his sheep. He said, I'm going to fix it all up. I'm going to bring you all back to me. And then I'm going to fill you with my spirit because what you didn't or what you should have done in saying that you couldn't do I'm going to give you the ability to do it. I'm going to give you my spirit so you won't have an excuse. And folks still making excuses, still wanting to say, well, you know, we all sin. You need to quit saying we all sin. You need to reckon yourself dead to trespasses and sin and alive unto Elohim. See, we don't want to say what the Bible says. We want to look at our condition and we want to stay in our condition so that we can feel good about ourselves. Instead of saying like the Apostle Paul said, he said, woe unto me. He said, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And then he gave an answer. He said, through the Messiah, Yahshua, my Lord. That's how I'm going to get delivered. You and I have a deliverer to bring us up out of our bondage of sin. And guess what, Zion? If you're going to be in this first resurrection, 
You're going to have to be holy. You say, well, I can't do it every day. Look, you better strive the best you can. And if you sin, just repent. Just confess it. See, see the problem with people, the problem with people as it pertains to their holy walk is that they think that they, that, that they have to live in such a way that they'll never make a mistake. If you make a mistake, you need to get it straight immediately. Get it straight. You know, my relationship I have with, with my wife, we've had a, a lot of ups and downs, just like all marriages have. Disagreements, things said that shouldn't have been said, you know, things done that shouldn't have been done. And what I've learned to do in order to keep everything good is that if I say something that I know was wrong, regardless of what it is, I'll just come to her and and say, you know what? Uh, I shouldn't have did it that way. I shouldn't have said it that way. I know you took it that way, but I'm sorry. I, I, I did not mean to offend you or disrespect you. Please forgive me. I was wrong. I get it straight first. I get it straight immediately. You know, I don't go the route of pride and arrogance. You know how we, we brothers are. I feel like, nah, I ain't going to tell her nothing. She's supposed to be this. No. No. Get it straight. Quick. Keep the harmony. Yeah. What happens with us as believers, we, we, begin to, we begin to wallow in our inability. Instead of realizing that the Most High has made you and created you and I, with the ability to live obediently. Hallelujah. Don't tell me you can't live obediently. That's a lie. And don't let anyone lie to you that you can't live an obedient life. You can do anything you want to do. Oh, let me give you an example. Because money is a great motivator for many people. If you know you're going to work a job and you're going to make six figures on that job, and they tell you, these are the guidelines for working here. You can't be late. You know what? You're going to make sure you are never late. Mm -hmm. You're looking at that money. You're like, oh, man, that money's good, dog. Hey, <laughs> I'm going to make sure I'm up and I'm there 15, 20, maybe 30 minutes before we punch in. Mm -hmm. Hear me? That's how people think. They make sure that they read all of the material so that they can take care of all of the details in the performance of their job. Why? Because money is a motivator. It's a motivator. They'll make sure that they will not make any mistakes. That, I mean, look, they will go through great pains to make sure they don't make a mistake. Why? Because money is a motivator. People demonstrate all the time their ability to keep commandments. They demonstrate all the time their ability to keep rules. They do it all the time. It depends on what motivates them. So quit lying about you can't keep the commandments. No, that's a lie. And all of you lying preachers out there that's enabling believers to try to tell them, well, you don't need to do all of that. Quit lying to them. The Most High has given them the ability to be obedient. The Most High will never say, do this or do that or don't do this or don't do that if he did not know that you have the ability to do it. So quit looking at your nature that is prone to be disobedient. Learn to kill it. Learn to deny it. Learn to die to it. That's what the scriptures teach. We find in the book Blessed and holy is he that had part in the first resurrection. Because the second death is not going to have any power over it. Second death will not have any power over it. You mean there's a second death? Yes. There's a second death. Scripture teaches us about a second death, which is a separation from the Almighty. But now this separation from the Almighty is an eternal separation from the Almighty. Mm -hmm. 
We find here in this sixth verse, we are told about the saints. And not only will they rule with Messiah, but it says that they shall also be priests unto Elohim and Messiah. <laughs> this means that there will be a priesthood in operation within the framework of this government that Messiah will have. The priesthood will be a Melchizedek priesthood. That's the first priesthood that function and serve the Most High Yah. Yes. Those who want to know some details about the Melchizedek priesthood, go to our YouTube channel, Voice of Messiah Ministries. We just did a teaching on the Melchizedek priesthood last Sabbath. Go look it up. You'll, you'll, you'll find out the details about it. The text says that the saints will serve as a priesthood unto Elohim. There'll be a Melchizedek priesthood. Why is there going to be a priesthood in this Messianic kingdom? Because, you know, many believers have this idea. Just bear with me for, for a moment because I know I've been long. I'm about to wrap this up in just five minutes. So many people have this idea that once everything is said and done, we, we're going to go to heaven. We're going to be with, the, be with Elohim and the saints forever and ever and ever. The next thing on the agenda of Elohim is not going into the heavens. It's ruling and reigning on the earth with Messiah for a thousand years. So why is there a need for a priesthood? Why? Because hmm? we've been told very plainly that they shall be, what? That, that's what's coming. Priests unto Elohim and Messiah. Because there are going to be people here that will have survived the great battle that our Messiah will have with the nations. There's going to be survivors. There's going to be people here that are going to need to be taught the ways of Elohim for that thousand year period. Because after the thousand years, our Satan is going to be let loose to cause some trouble before he is finally put into the lake of fire. We're going to get to all of them details. But let me show you something real quickly. I just want to go through these passages of scripture and we're going to wrap this up. There's going to be a rebuilt temple that will be in operation. In the book of Ezekiel chapters 40 through 46, Ezekiel talks about the temple that's going to be rebuilt. And he talks about the anointed Mashiach that will be coming in and out of the Eastern Gate. But also in the scripture, there will be survivors in this Messianic kingdom that will need to be taught. Let's go to the book of Zechariah. When you read in the book of Zechariah the prophet, the 14th chapter, it talks about the survivors. And it talks about that Everyone will have to come up to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Sukkot, Tabernacles. And it says that all of those who do not come up to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles will be destroyed with the curse. See, there's going to be survivors in this Messianic kingdom age. When you read in Zechariah chapter 14, Zechariah chapter 14 plainly tells us that Yahuwah is going to step down upon the Mount of Olives. That Yahuwah that's stepping down on the Mount of Olives is our Messiah, Yahshua. Yahushua. And after that, when he destroys his enemies, he's going to be king on the earth. But let's go to the book of Isaiah. I need to read this to us. The book of Isaiah. Yeshayahu. This is some important stuff right here. Book of Isaiah chapter 2. Verses 2 through 4. This is where we see in the scripture the prophecy that the people who will have survived will be taught the things of Elohim. Isaiah chapter 2, 
verse 2, it says, And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of Yahuwah's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. And what? All nations shall flow into it. And many people, now these many people are people of other nations. And many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of Yahuwah, to the house of the Elohim, the Elohim of Jacob. Now, when you see this terminology mentioned in the text about going up to the mountain of Yahuwah, to the Elohim of Jacob, these people are not claiming Yahuwah as their Elohim. That's why the text says we're going to go up to, y'all hearing me? To the Elohim of Jacob. Listen. Listen, and he will teach us of his ways. Zion will already know the ways of Elohim. Y'all listening to me. Zion will already know the ways of Elohim. Israel already knows the ways of Elohim. Now, there's a whole lot of verses I can pull alongside with this. Where there are other prophets that talk about that people of other nations will grab the skirt of the, of the Jew and say, let us go with you. Come on. It says, and he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the Torah and the word of Yahuwah from Jerusalem. Verse four. This ain't spiritualizing, y'all. This is, this is what's going to happen. Verse four. And he shall judge among the nations. So what did we read in the book of Revelation? What did we read in the book of Revelation that was given to those who were sitting upon the thrones? What does it say? That what? Judgment was given unto them. Did we not read that in the text? Amen. Did we not read that in the text? And here we have it right here. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people and they shall beat their swords into plowshares. Why are they beating swords in the plowshares? Because there was a great battle. There was a great war. And now the Messiah is king because he has dethroned all the other kingdoms. I'll keep reading. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. You hear this? O house of Yaakov, come ye and let us walk in the light of Yahuwah. Why is there a need for a priesthood? Why? Because there will be survivors who will need to be taught the way of Elohim. There will be people who will need to be trained in the things of Elohim. And this is what it's going to be like in the Messianic kingdom age. Where we will serve as Kohanim to our Elohim. This is our future destiny. Amen. And because this is our future destiny. It is important that in the right now, we be obedient to the word and the command. That we find our position and find our place in doing the work of the Almighty. Because what you and I do right now in our service unto Elohim determines our position in the Messianic kingdom age. Zion, I'm excited about what the word has prophesied to us about our destiny. I'm excited about what the word has said about where we are going and what we will be doing. But newsflash, Zion, should you stray, should you get in the flesh, should you think that there is nothing that you have to do 
for the king right now. Should you think that it don't matter whether you walk in the calling that the Most High has given you or not. You better rest assured what you do right now will determine your position in the future. And this is the reason why Yah shows us in his word our destiny because he wants us to be reminded of what's coming. He wants us to be reminded of our responsibility. He wants us to be reminded that we need to keep our hands on the plow and not look back. He reminds us that we need to stay steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the work of Yahuwah. He reminds us these things because he wants us to make it all the way to the end. Hallelujah. There's some that have gotten off track. There's some who have decided, well, he's not coming. I'll just do my own thing right now. I'll get back in the ministry. I'll get back in the things of the Most High. You know, or it's just an option. I don't have to serve him like this. Let me tell you something. You are not your own. You have been bought with a price. The Almighty owns you and I. And what we need to be doing is bowing on me and saying, Father, send me. Father, uh, deal with me. Father, show me. Hallelujah. Because he is going to require out of our lives the gifts that he has given. I don't want to be like the one that took all of that sum of money and put it in the ground and hit it. Knowing what my master required, yeah. but thinking, oh, well, I don't want to lose any of it. You know, I don't want to try and do anything. Some people don't even want to try. They don't even want to try and use what the Almighty has given to them. They just want to bury it. They, 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 they so caught up in their own thing. They figure, well, you know, if, if I can't do it like this, if I can't make it look like that, I'm just not going to do it. You're going to end up losing everything with that kind of attitude. You better get busy. You better take what you have and work it the best way that you know how. Well, I don't have the money. You don't need the money. You have, hallelujah, everything that you need right now with just you and the Ruach. And if the Ruach put a thought in your mind and say, go down the street and tell people y'all loves you. Go down the street and say y'all sure love you. If it's just that, go do it and watch what the Most High will do. Well, that's just simple. But when you do what the Most High says, the Most High will deliver people. It's not in what you do. It's not in what you create. It's not in what you put together. It's not in what you try to make look like what somebody else is doing. It's in the old obedience to what the Most High said that brings his power. Oh, he's the one that brings about the change in the lives of people. Not what you do, not what I do, not what you say, not what I say, but being obedient. <laughs> I'm closing, I'm closing, I'm closing. See, we done lost, we done lost the whole concept that it's Elohim, that's the one hey, that's in charge. We think we got to make it look good, sound good, be like this and be like that. And that's going to get the people coming. That's going to get them saved. You know what? Woo! Until we learn that it's all Elohim and by his power, we need to just learn how to be obedient. If you learn how to be obedient, the most high will bring people into the sanctuary. Oh, you see, Elohim has charge over everything. And he calls his servants to obedience. He calls his servants to submission. Oh, the Mosiah says, I alone in Elohim. And I draw the men from the north, the south, the east, and the west. And I make the way plain. And I show men their ways. And I am the one who brings them to repentance. Know that I am the one that is doing it and not you. Oh, how 
Hallelujah. Ina Mashando. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. It is Elohim that's the one that's in charge. It's Elohim that's the one that will bring the path, the purposes. There is no man that will take glory for what Elohim has instituted and put in place. He wants us to learn to be obedient. I don't care if you don't have the same gifts as somebody else has. It might appear to be nothing to you. Use what Elohim has put in you. Use what Elohim has put in you. You. Hallelujah. It don't make a difference how it looks to somebody else. The most I want your obedience. Ooh, Hallelujah. See, we done got so much in the flesh in the congregations. We done got so much in the flesh. We looking at what everybody else is doing and want to try to mimic them instead of falling on our face before the creator and saying, Abba Yah, you have your way. Oh, bless his name. I got to wrap this up. A layman. Oh, my goodness. Wanted to be healed. Oh, bless his name. And the prophet was asked about what this man should do to get healed. Oh, the prophet said, go and wash in that dirty river right there. Go wash in that dirt. And the man said, I ain't going down to wash that mess. I might get up more sick than what I came here. Look, you wouldn't tell anybody to go and wash in some dirty, nasty pool or dirty, nasty river. Mm. Prophet said, go wash in that. You want to be healed. Some of us, we, 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 we don't take time to think about that it's not about what we do and how we do it. It's about doing what Elohim said. Oh, y'all don't want this. This is the problem with this generation, this Western culture. It's so busy trying to make everything look good and not seeking what most high wants. Quit it. You weak preachers, quit it. Find out what Elohim wants and do it. And quit worrying about everybody else around you. Hey! Hallelujah. You see, we're in a day where the Almighty wants us to learn how to submit to his authority. He don't care about what everybody else is doing. He wants his will accomplished. He don't care about what I'm doing. He wants his will accomplished. Hallelujah. Zion, it's so vital in these days that we learn to just do what it is the Almighty wants us to do. And then rejoice, rejoice in the fact that he blesses us because of our obedience. Bless his holy name, I close. Father, I thank you for mercy. Father, I thank you for kindness. Father, I thank you for your goodness. I trust that the word which has gone forth has ministered life and peace, that it has touched people's lives, that it has broken yokes, that it has set people free. I pray, Abba Yah, that you have been glorified. Now, Abba, if there are any unbelievers touch them may they turn in repentance and may they come to you and we will bless you may your people strive to walk in holiness so that they may experience the first resurrection and now but we will give your great name the thanks and praise 
We do love you. Be glorified through the mighty name of Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah to the mighty one of Israel. We praise the Almighty today. We thank him so much Hallelujah. for his mercies, his kindness, and his goodness. We trust that you were encouraged through the teaching of the scriptures today and that the Almighty minister to you. Yes. At this time, we want to prepare ourselves for our Shalomim Communion Fellowship. We want to have our prayer of examination and then we shall share together. Let us pray. Abba Yah, we thank you so much for your mercies, your kindness, and your goodness. We ask you, Father, that you search us again. If there's any sin in us, forgive us. We confess it. If there's any bad relationships we have with other people, forgive us of our part so that, Abba Yah, we might have shalom with you and hopefully with them. Now, Abba, minister to us as we partake in this shalomim together. May we receive all of the benefits of it, and we will be careful to bless you through the mighty name of Yahshua, our Redeemer. Amen. Yes, 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 Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed are you, O Yahuwah, our Elohim, King of the universe. Bring our bread from the earth. We bless you for Messiah, that he is our bread of life and manna from heaven. Baruch Blessed are you, O Yahuwah, our Elohim, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. We bless you for the spilled blood of our Redeemer, Yeshua, that has been given for our redemption and healing in the renewed covenant.
as Yahuwah, for besides still blood that has been given for our redemption and healing and the relief of it. and trust that you have been ministered to and strengthened that you have been edified spiritually enriched if there are tithes or offerings that you have to present to the almighty you can go to our website at www.ncmmi.20m.com and you can click the donate button also you can share by cash app which is our preferred method of donating and our cash app code is dollar sign NCMMI. We want to thank you so much again for your participation in this holy set of parts Shabbat gathering. Hallelujah. We want to encourage you to tell others that they might join in and receive of the ministry that Elohim has for them. Mm -hmm. At this time, we want to prepare ourselves to speak the final blessing and then be dismissed. Let us all stand. Yevarekeka Yahuwah, the Yismareka Yair Yahuwah Panav, Ileka Vikuneka, Yesa Yahuwah Panav, Ileka Veyesim Leka Shalom. Now may Yahuwah bless you and protect you. May Yahuwah make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May Yahuwah lift up his countenance upon you and give you Shalom. Avinu Shalom Aleichem, our Father's peace be upon you. Shabbat Shalom to each one of you. Shabbat Shalom. Go in peace. You are dismissed.